my review of the America History and Life with Full Text database returned several articles and books referencing the American journalist Dorothy Thompson. One article, uh, Dorothy Thompson Underestimates Hitler by Peter Carlson, explores Thompson's one and only meeting with the future dictator of Germany in 1931. Her withering description of Hitler's physical appearance and her contention that the Austrian rabble-rouser could never be the leader of the German nation haunted her reputation for, for years to come. A second article in American Journalism, uh, Loretta Stack's Dorothy Thompson as Liberal Conservative Columnist, Gender, Politics, and Journalistic Authority, was abstract only, but the Internet Archives housed the entire volume from 1995, including this article. Steck points to the February 1939 meeting of the German-American Bund at Madison Square Garden, where Dorothy Thompson took a seat in the press area and proceeded to respond to the speeches with gales of laughter. Steck contends with good reason that the press treatment of uh, the incident reduced its significance to a battle between genders rather than a battle between political ideologies. Much of Thompson's career had been a battle against those among her colleagues who tried to reduce her to a female or woman reporter instead of what she was, a savvy reporter uh, and an even more effective opinion uh, maker. A third article attempted to link the dystopian vision of a fascist America espoused by Thompson's second husband, the novelist Sinclair Lewis, with the advent of the Trump administration. It can't happen here or has it. Sinclair Lewis's Fascist America by Ellen Strensky appeared in <clears throat> the journal Terrorism and Political Violence in 2017. And it attempts to draw parallels between Lewis's fictional would-be American dictator Buzz Windrip and the meteoric rise to the presidency of the real estate developer and television star. While there are similarities, the differences between Lewis's character and the 45th president are striking. Windrip is an unabashed anti-Semite as well as a libertine who hides his personal shortcomings behind a veil of religion. The difficulty of making a cohesive argument that Mr. Trump hid his personal attitudes and moral shortcomings is clear as is the lack of support for arguments that he or his administration was in any way anti-Semitic. The article points to the dangers inherent in polemic posing his history in an attempt to draw parallels between a nation under the weight of the Great Depression and a multicultural, multiracial 21st century America seeking some respite from the pressures and devastation of globalization. First, the article Dorothy Thompson Underestimates Hitler by Peter Carlson examines the origin story of Dorothy Thompson's career as a journalist and commentator. Thompson had married uh, novelist Sinclair Lewis in 1927, and she had been trying to interview the Nazi party leader since the failed Beer Hall Putsch of 1923. The Nazi Party's um, success at the polls in the Reichstag elections made Hitler a viable candidate for chancellor, and his American press liaison, Ernst Putzi Hauschtangel, convinced the Fuhrer to meet with the foreign press representatives in his suite at the Kaiserhof Hotel in Berlin. Left waiting in the lobby, Hitler eventually summoned Thompson to his suite. Thompson was underwhelmed by his appearance and his inability to conduct a one-to-one -one conversation. Instead of answering her written questions in a conversational tone, Hitler spoke to her as if he was addressing a vast audience. Carlson's account of the meeting is well-worn territory, uh, with quotations from Thompson's book, I Saw Hitler, in which he called the future dictator of Germany, quote, formless, almost faceless, a man whose countenance is a caricature, a man whose framework is carted Carta Angelus without bones. He's inconsequent, invaluable, ill-poised, insecure. He is the very prototype of the little man. The eyes alone are notable, dark gray and hyperthyroid. 
They have the peculiar shine which often distinguishes geniuses, alcoholics, and hysterics, end quote. Comparing Hitler to the great statesmen of Germany's past and present, Thompson found him wanting and declared that he could never be dictator of Germany, claiming, oh Adolf, Adolf, you will be out of luck. Carlson connects the publication of I Saw Hitler to her later expulsion from Germany within 24 hours in 1934. The explanation for her expulsion provided by the German secret police and the Nazi government was that her writings had abused the hospitality of the German nation and people. Naturally, the press of the time referred to the above quotation as a motivation for Hitler to get rid of a thorn in his side. Oddly, the German government had allowed Miss Thompson to enter and leave Germany several times since January 30, 1933's accession to power. My proposed research adds some clarity to Thompson's activities during that time and a possible alternate explanation for her sudden expulsion. Loretta Steck's Dorothy Thompson as liberal conservative columnist, gender politics and journalistic authority makes some important and valid points about Ms. Thompson's storied career. Her thesis, quote, quote the entanglements of gender and ideology compromised Thompson's ability to protest and act as a progressive force when she participated in the linguistic realm of political journal journalism. The possibilities and limits of her voice were defined by her position as a woman trying to gain power in the male-dominated media as a columnist rather than a news correspondent and as an advocate of political affiliations. It's difficult to disentangle. First, the statement assumes Thompson's natural inclinations were to act as a progressive force and that those inclinations were stymied. Anti-New Deal, anti-communist, and a rather tepid supporter of labor unions, Thompson's writing in the Republican-supporting New York Herald Tribune must be taken at face value. Rarely during her time at the Herald Tribune, under the leadership of Ogden and Helen Reed, was she at odds with her employers. Steck accurately states that Thompson's reach was dependent upon a, quote, media establishment. However, in Thompson's case, day-to-day -day editorial was headed by a woman, Helen Reed. The fear of offending advertisers played a much greater role in Thompson's demise at the Herald Tribune than gender. Ellen Strensky's It Can't Happen Here or Has It, my third article, since Sinclair Lewis's Fascist America appeared in a 2017 volume of Terrorism and Political Violence. The piece attempts to liken a character from Lewis's novel, It Can't Happen Here, a work featuring a large amount of input from his wife, Dorothy Thompson, to the nascent political career of Donald Trump. Strensky, an English professor at the University of California, Irvine, sees the character of Buzz Windrup, an anti-Semitic American president who becomes a military fascist dictator as a precursor of today. She points to similarities. Windrup is described as, uh, by Lewis as, quote, vulgar, almost illiterate, a public liar easily detective, and his ideas, and he quotes ideas, almost idiotic. Windrup's followers, the League of Con Forgotten Men, are a, quote, a mob of camp followers who identified political virtue with money, end quote. Parallels such as these tell us more about Strensky's own political bias, biases than either Windrup or Mr. Trump. Windrup goes on to, abo to um, abolish political parties and establish one party in the novel. Strensky compares Windrup's political mastermind, quote, a sinister advisor, to Steve Bannon. From that point on, we're treated to what can only be termed stretching. A case in point, quote, Windrup's campaign trade, scarlet and silver, ebony paneled, silk upholstered, streamlined, diesel engined, rubber padded, air conditioned, aluminum forgotten man special. Yet even this example evokes the ostentatious display of Donald Trump's Boeing 757 tricked out with things like Rolls-Royce engines, 24-karat gold-plated seatbelts, and silk walls. 
Well, there are the similarities then, because it could also evoke the traveling entourage of almost every presidential candidate or campaign plane leased or purchased by the winning Republican or Democratic nominee. The comparisons therein are interesting, but hardly point to the advent of American fascism. Granted, the article was published in 2017, and with the... Uh, uh, events of January 6th, uh, she probably sees even more uh, more uh, parallels between Windrup and uh, Trump. Uh, but in this case, the military was markedly against anything that Trump might have done to overturn the election. Um, and it's... Uh, It's a fallacious comparison between the two. So you have two, two uh, articles that uh, one is, goes over well-worn uh, well uh, territory. The second is slightly more um, contributory because of its perspective on gender. And the third is more a polemic by an English professor than a a, uh, uh, a historical uh, uh, paper. Thank you.